welcome back to Creating Genius. What the heck should I eat is a question that I actually find myself asking almost every day. I've been working in some capacity in, in the health industry for, it's been almost six years now, and I still find myself completely baffled by the amount of information out there on all sorts of different diets. I really enjoy sorting through the research on the way diets like keto or vegan or carnivore or high carb impact our gene function, our hormone function, but it's still, it's overwhelming. A lot of the studies on the diets, they're not really done in a bio-individual way. So yes, like I can get information on how a certain diet may potentially impact your health, but you know, I still don't know. And when I'm making recommendations to clients or when clients ask me things, it's still a lot of really just trial and error and hit or miss. And social media seems to make this a whole lot worse because things are so extreme. I've seen posts that basically take everything that you could possibly think of and, and find a study or a reason saying it's bad for you. I've seen, you know, there there's satire ones where it's like, oh, well, you can't eat plants, but you can't eat meat, but you can't um, have vegetables. You can't have anything. Okay, so I'll just drink water. Oh, there's a study showing that all the water has uh, chlorine in it. And so they just don't drink water. Spending time in the health section of Instagram can really can really make you feel like you might as well just not eat anything ever. And then there's, you know, the whole fasting thing about all the health benefits that are associated with it, but then people arguing that fasting's bad for you and it's craziness. And and if you're getting your diet information mainly from social media, it is a recipe for overwhelm. My biggest complaint about the way social media portrays eating, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about the study, is there's no nuance. And honestly, it makes sense because social media is not designed really with nuance in mind. The claims that are the boldest, that are the most extreme, are going to have the most impact because people are either gonna be like, oh my God, this is amazing, or oh my God, you're an idiot, this is so stupid. And it's reactions, whether they're positive or negative, like that's going to be the stuff that gets the most traction. And, you know, if people are commenting, whether they're saying this guy's a fucking idiot or he knows or he or she knows exactly what they're talking about, that's apparently how this stuff all gets tracked. And and so that's what we're shown as we're just kind of scrolling through our, our, our feeds. Someone with a decent following coming out and saying that we should rinse our eyes with coffee is going to make some waves because this person has influence and something like that is an absurd statement. And, you know, I've seen so much stuff about how insulin's only role is for fat storing. Um, I've seen stuff about how blending fruit changes the glycemic index of the food to make your blood sugar go up four times more than it would by just eating the banana. I've seen stuff saying that drinking fruit juice has zero impact on your blood sugar. It's all... There's so much just, there's like these one-off claims. And the reality is that's just, that's not how these things work. You know, one person could have, you know, genetics or a hormone situation that makes them very sensitive to blood sugar spikes. You know, someone pre-diabetes. Yeah, maybe blending a banana might make their blood sugar go up four times more. And if they studied four people who happened to be pre-diabetic and the data that they got was that the, the banana after you broke down the fiber by blending it made the blood sugar go crazy then okay that's the study and there's so much information about all the different toxins and foods you know things like lectins or phytic acid or oxalic acid which i'm going to talk about a little later in this in this podcast um you know, linoleic acid, seed oils, like I, I talked about last show. We're just bombarded with this information. Oh, like broccoli has uh, iso isothiocyanates, something like that, that disrupt thyroid function. 
like if you want to be scared about food you can find something to back up you being scared about just any just about any food that's out there so i want to bring a little um a little clear-headedness to this i'm going to take a step back the thing about all these statements in isolation is that our bodies are equipped and actually built to handle toxins every single food in the environment has toxins in it a, a strawberry has toxins a mango has toxins you know meat even if you you know you could talk about cooking and and you know creating the the char and that's a carcinogen or whatever even raw meat has potentially like bacteria and and things on it that can cause a reaction you know plants have defense chemicals nuts and seeds also have defense chemicals like even before the modern world and and before you know industrial agriculture like the food we ate had toxins in it and we were able to handle them and we are still able and we are still able to handle them in some situations when you're exposed to to things you know even in healthy foods or even in unhealthy foods you might feel like crap but your body has the resilience to bounce back from this exposure. And that's one thing that I like to keep in mind and I tell people to keep in mind on their quest to find a way of eating that works for them. 100% perfect is simply not attainable. And I always wonder if the focus on particular food toxins is really worth it. Um, that extra stress, is it really doing much for you besides causing you added stress and you know I, I i go back and forth there are some people that are affected in an outsized way by particular toxins and there are others who in their quest to try to eat perfectly stress themselves out even more and it, and it just makes everything worse and so it really is like you know eating is a case-by-case -case basis there's no perfect diet that i can recommend to anybody and I think, you know, part of this that's really important is the genetics. And and one of the reasons why I became so interested in it in the first place is because our genetic variants really impact how we can break down certain um toxins that we're exposed to in our food. And I, like I mentioned earlier, so one of them is oxalic acid or oxalates. That one gets a lot of attention. It's found in spinach, kale, Swiss chard, uh, in lower levels in potatoes and, and nuts. And in our body, this oxalic acid has the potential to bind to calcium and iron and other minerals. And it actually has the potential to form these like razor sharp crystals. And there, that one actually is a little scary. And excess oxalic acid is one of the main causes of kidney stones. And so again, if I were to just say that, you know, I can say all those things and that does sound scary you'd be like oh my god i would never want to eat kale or spinach ever again but this is where genetics you know comes into play we have four genes in particular that impair our ability to break down this oxalic acid and if you have variants on those genes you are more prone to having high oxalic acid and to things like kidney stones or joint pain or you know all these symptoms that are related my mom has a bunch of variants here. I have a few. My brother has a, a bunch. My mom has had more kidney stones than everyone else that I know in my life combined. She has had a ton of them. It's it's unbelievable. And then if you go and look at her genes, it's like, oh my God, this makes sense. Because it's always about the genes and the environment. If you don't have the variants that impact your ability to break down these oxalates, if you eat them you're just going to break them down but if you're eating them and you have the variants you're saying to your body hey we need to break down these ox oxalates and your body's like i don't have the machinery i don't have the um you know the the proteins to do this and so you're stimulating genes and they're not working quite as well as as you would want them to to break these down and so you you have you know this acid in high levels it's binding to calcium it's binding to iron you get you know kidney stones and the thing is even even in these cases it's still somewhat rare um you know it's not like my mom never eats oxalates and it's 
you know, she probably has a, a fair amount of them every week. And she does get kidney, you know, she's gotten a few kidney stones, but it's not like she gets a kidney stone every week. It's it's not like she eats a, a, a piece of kale and then two days later, oh, another kidney stone. I would assume that it's the exposure kind of built up over time because you're inefficient breaking them down. Okay, that's fine. You have it once a week. You're probably over time, you're going to be able to deal with that even if you're not as efficient breaking it down. But it's like if you're having every day compounded over months, then, you know, maybe you might run into trouble. And so this is why one of the, but this is one of the reasons why knowing your genetics is so important because it allows us to actually take a nuanced approach to your nutrition because you can avoid foods that you might have potential weaknesses to. Like if we go through... And like my mom, if you can't break down ox, well, not you can't, if you have the potential to not break down oxalates as well, then we'd be like, hey, spinach every day, probably not the best idea, right? At the same time, it's like if you have it once every two weeks or if you go out and eat spinach, it's probably not going to be the end of the world. You know, that's the, the other thing. It's, it's more about like, okay, day to day, what makes sense here? It's not ever all or nothing. Like I really, I, sh I talked about that last time with the seed oils and I w I'm going to mention that all every time because 90, you know, whatever, let's say 85%, if you avoid oxalates, 85, if you, okay, backing up, if you have these variants and you avoid oxalates 85% of the time, you're going to do, you're going to do well. And there are different, you know, there are nutrients that we can give to help you break them down and to stimulate the genes and the enzymes to do that. And so it's like, not only, okay, we know you've got this weakness, we're going to avoid it. But if you do, you know, here, we've also got some stuff that we can give you to help out. And so that's why it's so important because, you know, it gives us multiple ways to, to go about supporting your health. I, I like to take this approach because... Then we really know, okay, what are the, the, the sort of inconvenient things that actually make sense to avoid and what are the things that you're probably going to be fine with? So let's say someone is, is very sensitive to their environment and they're like gluten-free, dairy-free, low histamine, low mold, low oxalate, low everything, just because they're trying to eliminate all potential inflammatory foods. And so they're left eating five things <laughs> and we look at their genetics and their histamine genes are fine their everything is fine the only real problem is the oxalates and so then we can be like okay instead of making your life and your eating so stressful because you can only eat five things let's just focus on being you know as close to 100 percent oxalate free as possible and see what happens here and so, you know, again, it, it can make everything less stressful because instead of avoiding everything, you're avoiding the things that your genetics say you should avoid. And I do want to give a little caveat here is, you know, there are situations, especially in chronic illness, where you, you have to be really, really strict. You're so sensitive that your symptoms are going to dictate how we approach this. And, and that was the case for me. And a lot of times I think the genetics do inform this. Like I've got issues with histamine genetically. I've got issues with oxalates. I've got issues with like peanuts and other stuff. And so it's like, if you look at my genetics, there are a lot of things that when I'm feeling really sensitive, I would want to avoid. And so it's, it's a balance. You know, if we don't know the genetics and someone's really, really sensitive, they may need to, to, you know, look all the, look over all the stuff. And then a lot of times when we test the genetics and they are really sensitive, we figure out why someone is so sensitive. And that's because they have these genetic, you know, predispositions. And so, you know, then it, then it makes more sense to, to really, you know, be super strict about the food, but that's not for everyone. That's, that is for the most sensitive people. And, and, you know, in my practice, I try to avoid having people eat super super strict as much as possible because it's not sustainable part of my job as a as a coach and a, and a guide is to help people lower their stress around food like i don't want to make it more stressful that's the last thing i want to do 
because that excess stress is going to be worse, way worse for you than eating a little more oxalates than, than some doctor told you you should. Moving on. So this begs the question. So how should I eat if I don't know my genetics? And that is a really good question. Um, as, you know, as someone who does what I do, when I'm the clients that I have that I do genetics with and the, versus the clients that I don't do genetics with, my job is a lot easier when, when I know genetics because one, I, I, I'm very well versed in it and two, there, it just it gives me so much more information about prioritizing things because if I don't know, then I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and that's really, that leads me to the answer. The most important thing to look at in terms of how should I eat if I don't know my genetics is how do I feel after I eat? Like I was saying before, you know, when I was sick, I had a symptom flare up with basically everything I ate. And I just looked for the foods that gave me the least amount of flare up. I was, there's fatigue, brain fog, headaches, GI issues. It was every time I ate. And, you know, I'm going to tell a little story here. So as I was getting healthy, I was still operating under the assumption that, okay, I'm just supposed to feel like shit every time I eat. And it's just varying levels of how crappy I feel. It wasn't until very recently that I had the thought of adjusting how I ate based on how I felt after eating. Because I was so used to and so programmed by the experience that I was having to just be like, okay, you know, it's going to be a couple hours before I feel like myself again after eating. And I was doing intermittent fasting. I had done it for really, you know, I've been doing it for actually not really doing it anymore. I was doing it for years and, and it was great because I felt awesome during the period that I wasn't eating. Not eating breakfast, I felt great. I wouldn't eat until like one or two. And when I woke up in the morning, you know, it took me a little while to kind of like get going. But once I woke up, my brain was sharp. I had tons of energy. I had focus. I was super productive. And that basically lasted until I got really, really hungry. But then when I would eat, I felt kind of crappy. My energy was sapped for a little while. I was really sluggish. And I just didn't feel great. And, and I just kind of thought, okay, this is how it's going to be when I break my fast. So when I was breaking my fast, I did it with basically high protein, high fat. I was operating under the assumption that all carb, not all carbs are bad, but that I didn't want to break my fast with a high carb meal. Um, an example would be three eggs and, and an avocado. And those are healthy things. I think, you know, vegans aren't going to eat eggs, but I think we would all agree that those are objectively healthy foods. But once I realized, oh my God, maybe I don't need to feel like crap after I eat all the time, I was I had the thought like, maybe this isn't working for me. There could be a million different biochemical mechanism reasons. It could be like hormone balance. It could be insulin. It could be vitamin status, cofactor status that could be affecting this. You know, I could go on for days about all of the different things that could have been causing this. And I find it fascinating, but this sort of circles back to the whole media, social media eating problem. If I'm worrying about what eating carbs will do to my blood sugar or what eating fat will do because of some mechanism that some influencer talked about, then I could be missing the forest for the trees. I was getting information every time I ate, which was, you feel like shit. <laughs> and, you know, once I was out of the being sick every day, phase of my life that was that's really all the information I needed to tell me that doing what I was doing wasn't working and at the end of the day who cares what the science is behind it I don't know all I can do is guess all I know is I'm gathering data from my body in the form of brain fog and sluggishness and that's telling me this isn't working I realized part of the programming from being sick was accepting that eating the first meal of my day would make me feel poorly. Dinner, I was fine with. But it took, you know, it was a while before that first meal of the day, you know, I stopped struggling with it. I realized well, maybe there was something I could do about this. In the spirit of, of changing that program, I had to introduce some new information. I had to do something differently. You know, fasting till one and then eating a high protein, high, car, uh, high, protein, high fat diet, not working. Got to change it up. So I came up with three, basically 
three options of, of new information. I could not fast, so I could eat my first meal, you know, instead of waiting five or six hours after I woke up, I could eat it right when I woke up or like one to two hours after. The second one was breaking my fast with a meal that had carbs as opposed to um, doing it with, with just fat. And so that would be like keeping my fasting period until one or two or 12, 12 to two somewhere, but then breaking that fast with some carbs. And then the third one was having like actual breakfast, you know, within two hours of waking up and having carbs. Um, my instincts, my intuition was telling me as I was, you know, doing this mental exercise that it was the high fat that was causing my post meal fatigue rather than the fasting. But I wanted to introduce as much new information as possible. I wanted to do the thing that was the least similar to what I was doing. And so I chose option three, which was I was would eat breakfast and I would have some carbs. And what do you know? As soon as I started doing that, my post-meal fatigue and my energy throughout the day was much more stable. Um, when I made the adjustment, I, I did it really simply. I didn't get super fancy. And I'm just looking at this like very, like, what am I doing? What can I change? And so I was like, I want to not have as much fat. I want to have some carbs and I'm going to eat earlier. So I took out the thing that was highest in fat, the avocado, and then I just added in a piece of fruit or two. So it was like an egg or a couple eggs a banana and an orange or like yeah I maybe mean, even started with just like a couple eggs and an orange no crazy recipes i wasn't like oh my god i need 50 grams of carb 50 grams of carbs 50 grams of proteins no like calorie counting it was just a little experiment i'm going to basically i got the intuition point that it was the fat that was the excess fat that was causing the fatigue that my body wanted some carbs and so i was like We'll switch that one thing easy. We'll see what happens. And it really worked. So there were a few pieces of information that I needed to make this change. So I, what I had was I had what I was eating, when I was eating, and the symptoms associated with the eating. Like I said, the signal something was wrong was the symptoms. And that led me to either adjust the when or the what I was eating. And in, in my case, I chose to do both. I think it's a good example of just because someone's telling you something is good doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for you. Even the best intentioned influencer, they don't know your genetics. Me talking about this right now, I don't know your genetics. I mean, I may if, if you're someone I work with, but, but the, you know, it's really hard to, to come up with individualized approach. And, and so in your life, you have to look at the data that you have. And so that's, again, like I said, it's like when you eat, what you eat, and how you feel after eating. So the best advice I can give for figuring out what to eat is to start with whole foods. The when you're eating and the what in terms of what nutrients should I avoid, what, you know, what specific like diet or whatever that stuff matters way less if you are eating like crap like if you're having a pop tart for breakfast and you're having mcdonald's for dinner how long you're fasting for it, it doesn't matter <laughs> it's like it doesn't matter as much i will say and so it's all about starting with whole foods and and my best advice for that is to cook from home as much as possible and eat as little things from a package as possible that's not very sexy advice i i know but you would be surprised at how much of a difference going from five home cooked meals a week to 10 makes you know and you can plan it all out i've worked with clients on literally just making schedules like we've spent entire sessions or multiple sessions just making schedules for them to eat. And, you know, we went through, made literally listed out 
all of the foods that her family liked. And so they had to do as little guesswork around the eating as possible. You know, we, we put together like a, it was like a skeleton plan. So we've got a list of all the vegetables and, and non-protein sources that, that her family would eat. And then it was, you know, like Monday would be steak, Tuesday chicken, Wednesday would be like a foreign, you know, Italian or Mexican night, Thursday fish, and then Friday chicken again. So at the end of the day, coming home from work, or if they wanted to prep before, they knew what they were going to be making. And then, you know, over the weekend, you could get out, uh, go out and, and get all the necessary things. You know, you would be really surprised at how much of a difference um just planning things out uh, makes. If 80 to 90% of the meals you are making are home-cooked meals and, and made with whole foods like fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, tubers, and then, you know, good quality protein sources. And, and you know, we can you can always adjust based on if you're vegan, vegetarian, or, you know, what ethical requirements that you have. If that's your foundation. I'm pretty confident you're going to be in a good spot. And then from there, once that's, that foundation is, is really solid, then, then we look at the symptoms and we start to adjust things based on that. But if the basics aren't locked in, the even stuff like supplements and, and genetics won't have the same impact as they could. Like if you're eating just flatly like inflammatory foods twice a day, whether you're have whether you're like not able to break down oxalates or you're making excess inflammation from holding on to too much iron or all of these, you know, fancy and, and fun things that we can do. It's, it, it just isn't going to have as much of an impact. And, you know, many times lessening the burden of how much processed food you're eating is enough to make some pretty significant health changes. But sometimes that isn't enough. And, and that's when we start to look at when are you eating, you know, what are your genetics, what are the types of foods, what are the combinations of foods that you're eating, and then we go from there. But I always believe more in the foundation. That's how I healed myself. It, there was no magic pill. It was. It started with dialing in my food. It started with getting, you know, figuring out what was caught in what in my environment was causing me to get sick and diving really deep into my emotional state, my energetic state, my beliefs in patterns that were, you know, encouraging an emotional environment for me to be sick. When I was really going through it, there were no off days with my diet. I didn't have that luxury. If I if I wanted to, you know, feel stable, not even like okay. If I wanted to feel stable, I didn't have the luxury to to cheat on my diet. And that's why this is all nuance. Like my situation didn't allow for leeway. But now that it does, you know, I play around with things like part of the reason why I stopped having carbs at breakfast is because I couldn't handle having carbs at all. Like I felt so terrible when I had them, but now I'm feeling good, you know, and, and the way that I was doing things before stopped working for me and then I can change it around. But the foundation was still is still really solid. And because of that, I'm really able to assess whether the changes I make actually do have an impact. So if I were to create a movement on social media, maybe I will. It would be about the nuance and individuality of nutrition. We are unique beings. We have unique genetics. We have unique health histories. We're sensitive to different things. We have different circadian rhythms. You know, this is called bio-individuality. I intend to honor my own bio-individuality, and I want to get to a point where that is what the most popular influencers on, on social media and, and what the news talks about, like that you have to figure it out for yourself and that there's no one size fits all. And as much as I find the different diets and the, the biochemical mechanisms of how, how food toxins may be affecting us fascinating, and I do, and I, it's something that I research in my spare time and am a total nerd about, I also realize that it gets to a point where it's not practical that even the best intentioned individuals are putting out stuff that's not serving the public like it's either too extreme or it takes too much money to do and 
you know, it's becoming disconnected from, from the reality that we live in. They just want to get a little more of a level-headed approach. The best advice I can give is stick to those whole foods, make a schedule to automate your meal planning, cook as much as possible. In terms of eating, that is the foundation to eating like a genius. And it's something that I practice. It's something that I recommend people practice. And, you know, that that's it's one of the most important things. Diet is one of those foundational pieces. Um, and, it, and it can affect everything. It can affect your emotional state. It can affect your mental state. It can totally affect the way your brain works. And, you know, there are some people that believe that you can... Um, out meditate or out spiritualize a a bad diet or out exercise a bad diet um, to a certain extent you might be right but i'm not here looking for good enough like i want for myself for my clients for my friends for you know for everybody like i want us to be functioning at the peak the optimal not just like yeah i survived today i wanted to be like yeah today was awesome like i had it dialed in i felt great about you know not about anything i just felt great i got a ton of energy like that's that's what i'm striving for and and i believe that diet is a foundational piece to that and so i'm gonna keep talking about it because <laughs> because it is it is so important so thank you for tuning in and i will see you next time on creating genius